Good morning. Welcome to today's Galaxy Digital Conference Call. Today's call is being recorded. At this time, all participants are on listen-only mode. Following the formal remarks, we'll conduct a question and answer session. Webcast participants can submit questions online directly through the webcast. Further instructions will be provided as Q&A begins. At this time, I'd like to turn the conference over to the Investor Relations team. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good morning and welcome to Galaxy Digital Shareholder Update Conference Call. We're joined today by our founder and CEO, Mike Novogratz, President Chris Ferraro, and Chief Financial Officer, Ash Prithy paul Before we begin, please note that our remarks today may include forward-looking statements. Actual results may differ materially from those indicated or implied by our forward-looking statements as a result of various factors, including those identified in our filings with the Canadian Securities Regulatory Authorities on CEDAR and available on our website. Forward-looking statements speak only as of today and will not be updated. In addition, none of the information on this call constitutes a recommendation, solicitation, offered by Galaxy Digital or its affiliates to buy or sell any securities, including Galaxy Digital Securities. And with that, I'll now turn it over to Mike Novogratz. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope it's a wonderful morning where you are. Uh, it certainly is here in uh, Long Island. Uh, um, listen, this is going to be a more fun call uh, than our last few. Uh, you know, I, I think back to, you know, fourth quarter last year, early this year, and our mindset was, you know, tighten the belt, uh, make sure costs are under control, and and grind through till, you know, the the space really started picking up. Uh, you know, we had made this bet early on on the institutionalization of crypto that that it would move from a a broadly retail driven market to to more and more institutional adoption and that was slow and i would tell you that the world changed in in the crypto space and in our space with covid uh you know covid really accelerated both the digitalization of everything right microsoft ceo said they did in two months what they thought two years would take um but certainly in our space uh, so you've got the digitalization of assets, but you also have the macro story, which has brought in the adoption of Bitcoin as a, a proper inflation hedge, a proper uh, risk hedge, uh, a proper hard asset uh, for many, many people. And so, you know, when things change, hopefully, you know, smart companies change. And so our mindset and certainly my mindset has shifted uh, dramatically in, in, into one of you know, growth into one of investment in the business into one of, you know, uh, really excitement about the opportunity ahead. Uh, I'm going to kind of do macro, and, and Chris Ferraro is going to then take over and, and go through the business units in micro and talk about the quarter. Uh, but big picture, uh, we had a very good second quarter. Uh, you know, a lot of that was, you know, Bitcoin going up, but it wasn't just Bitcoin going up. It was our trading desk doing over a billion dollars in OTC volume, by far our biggest uh, month in OTC volume. Uh, asset management, linking up partnerships, uh, our investment banking team uh, having lots of mandates, you know, from being an idea to actually a real banking team. And I think you'll see in the next quarter uh, real results of that. Um, and our, our venture our venture book, uh, lots of the, the bets we had made in the last couple of years starting to really perform. And I think same thing in the future, you're going to see, you know, some hopefully, uh, you know, good write-ups in that, in that space. And so I'm, I'm sitting here today more optimistic than I've been any time in the last two years, uh, ready to make investments in the business. Uh, the, the overall outlook is, is, is bright, but I would also say, you know, in, in both a, a tough, a tough scenario and, and in a good scenario, the competition is coming. We're not the only people that are investing in this business. And so the bright side of that is it really credentializes the whole space. You've got, you know, banks getting into the custody business. You've got other people hiring bright employees to get into the trading business. Uh, more money is going into venture. And so if there was a doubt that blockchain, crypto, Bitcoin was a business a year ago, uh, that doubt is over. And now it's people investing in the, in the space and the space growing. Um, you know, there'll be moments where it grows uh, and the prices go up, you know, too fast, uh, and then you'll, you'll have some corrections. But in general, I think we've crossed the Rubicon. We've crossed the bridge that, that this isn't, that this might not happen, right? Bitcoin is now an asset. Uh, blockchain are being deployed all over the place. 
And so in a lot of ways, the last few months have been really uh, the most important few months in the history of this space because now it's established. And so, you know, that leaves me excited, it leaves me excited for our team. You know, we, we, we are increasing uh, headcount. We're going to, you know, bring in more talent. Uh, we, you know, we're doing good things here. We, we got, uh, we upgraded from the TS, XV to the TSX, uh, our stock price has gone up significantly. You know, we were buying stock uh, at the end of last year, thinking this was really frustrating. Our stock was constantly trading below book, and trading with very little energy. And since then, I think the markets recognized the shift in the overall space and the shift in our company. And so I'm going to leave it there and pass to Chris, but I would tell you, you know, I'm bullish. I'm optimistic. Uh, I think Bitcoin has a long way to go. I think DeFi is just getting started. I think the rest of the projects have new energy in them. And so uh, that's what I want you to take from my, my messages today, one of positive energy and excitement. Chris? Thanks, Mike. Um, I'll start by con- uh, confirming that we continue to monitor the COVID-19 situation daily um, and are managing the firm's response to the pandemic as such. Um, to that end, we've announced a continuation of our primarily remote working environment, which we expect to continue with through at least the end of September. Uh, is partial work from home effective for us? Yes. Is it as good as being together? No. Uh, we we prefer to be back at our desks as we, uh, as a team, thrive working uh, together in the trenches. That said, uh, I continue to be proud of and impressed by the team's productivity, commitment, and accomplishments in 2020. Just as importantly, we recognize the importance of our people and our culture, and therefore have taken the opportunity during this unusual period of remote connectivity to engage as a team and help define and cultivate our culture, including recurring all-hands Zoom meetings, our first employee survey, teach-ins on industry topics, the formation of a diversity and inclusion committee at the firm, monthly salons with external thought leaders on the topics of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and also recurring Zoom breakfasts and happy hours with senior team leaders from around the firm. Moving briefly on to markets, uh, and this is, this is largely Mike's category, um, uh, but saying 2020 remains unique, I think, would be quite the understatement for the year. Um, I'm not sure, uh, after witnessing the volatility and asset price declines in March, that any of us would have predicted Apple today at nearly $2 trillion in market cap. But what we did know in March and April uh, was that the fundamental investment case for Bitcoin for traditional investors was crystallizing at an extraordinary pace on the back of unprecedented global central bank balance sheet expansion. Everyone saw it happening, but few outside those of us focused on the supply side theory of money recognized the clear implications of these actions, and then the world started to wake up. And so now Bitcoin is up 60% year-to-date uh, and, and up 26% alone since uh, the June 30 quarter end. Moreover, other cryptocurrencies, particularly Ethereum, has also experienced outsized price appreciation on the back of incremental network technology developments and new and increased user engagement, particularly around DeFi, which you'll hear about. You can see that in the Bloomberg Galaxy Crypto Index's basket of cryptocurrencies, which is now up 89% year-to-date and 47% uh, just since the quarter end. The performance of the cryptocurrency markets in FY2020 should now be difficult to ignore by any global investor who's paying attention. It compares favorably by a significantly wide margin versus almost every other liquid asset class year to date. Markets can be fickle, but they tend to trend towards the truth in the long run. And we here at Galaxy have a long-term fundamental thesis, and thus far the trend is pointing in our direction. With all this as a backdrop and Galaxy's ongoing maturation as an operating business, July, as Mike mentioned, was an opportune month for us to graduate from the TSX Venture Exchange to the main board of the TSX. The Canadian markets have been very supportive of innovation over the years, which is the primary reason why we chose to go public via an RTO on the TSX Venture Exchange back in 2018. Over the past year, we have met with public investors, conducted teach-ins for wealth advisors, discussed our business with equity analysts, and broadly committed to educating those interested in understanding and experimenting in the cryptocurrency, digital asset, and blockchain technology sector. This uplisting to the TSX is part of this evolution, not just of Galaxy Digital, but of the sector itself. And we take our mission of being the bridge between the institutional and crypto world seriously, especially as one of the most visible and active companies in the space. We'd like to thank the TSX, our Canadian regulators, and most importantly, our growing base of investors for their support over the past two years, and we do look forward to advancing our business and the sector here for years to come. Now, let me touch briefly on our second quarter performance. In Q2, Galaxy reported comprehensive income of $38.5 million, 
which puts Galaxy ahead on the year now with year-to-date comprehensive uh, income through June 30th of $10.8 million. This reflects both net realized and unrealized gains from digital assets and investing activities of $28.3 million, as well as year-over-year operating revenue growth of just over 24% for the first half of this year versus last across all of our operating business lines, including asset management and advisory service fees, financing activities, and derivative gains. Turning to our trading business, the second quarter of 2020 saw our OTC trading desk generate over a billion dollars of quarterly volume, our second largest quarter by volume in operating history. Additionally, Q2 OTC volumes represented over 15% sequential quarterly growth in over Q1 2020 and 46% sequential growth compared to Q4 2019. Even excluding OTC spot equivalent option volume, uh, which is a business that we've gotten into uh, uh, pretty significantly this year, our spot OTC volumes were still up 2% sequentially, while industry spot exchange volumes were down 17% which signals to us continued market share gains for the Galaxy trading platform. OTC desks that succeed and grow their volumes do so because they offer optimized outcomes for large bespoke trades that generic retail exchanges are unable to fulfill. For Galaxy's OTC desk, we believe our strong year-to-date volume growth continued to build in Q2 as a result of our sustained investments into key relationships in and around the space, low-cost access to a global diverse pool of liquidity, high-quality execution, as well as our differentiated profile as a trusted, public, and audited counterparty in the space. Institutions trade with Galaxy because we provide them with a knowledgeable and experienced team, low-cost market access, and a trusted counterparty who not only has the resources but is committed to delivering on our promises in any market conditions. To that end, in June, our trading business in BACT, which is Intercontinental Exchange's digital asset derivatives trading and custody platform, announced a partnership to launch a joint white glove service for asset managers looking to acquire, build positions in, positions in and securely store Bitcoin. Galaxy Trading is, a, is providing the market access, lending and financing, and a suite of bespoke structured products, while the backed warehouse, a qualified custodian of Bitcoin regulated by the NYDFS, is safeguarding those digital assets for the clients. We already have counterparties live in this joint solution, and we see this offering as a key point of differentiation and growth for the business going into second half 2020. Turning to asset management, 2020 has been a period of increased market demand for Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies generally. As we've said in previous quarters, our Galaxy Crypto Index Fund holds a basket of the largest, most liquid cryptocurrencies in order to provide broad-based exposure to the growth of the asset class, while our Bitcoin funds meet the growing institutional and wealth demand for safe, simple, secured ownership of Bitcoin for its store value utility in what is now becoming a clearly inflationary market environment. In June, Asset Management announced a strategic partnership with Case, a leading alternative investment platform to provide financial advisors with streamlined access to Galaxy Digital's investment products, as well as educational resources spanning blockchain and digital assets. The Case platform offers financial advisors with over a trillion dollars of client reach direct access to complete end-to-end solutions, including a broad selection of alternative investment funds and products, independent due diligence from Mercer, tools and analytics, a streamlined investment process, and integration with custodians for greater reporting accuracy. Galaxy Digital Capital Management is the only asset manager offering cryptocurrency and blockchain technology-related investment product on their platform. And as of today, we do expect to be live there and accepting subscriptions into our funds. We believe this speaks volumes to the long-term scalable infrastructure that we've worked so hard to put into place, and when paired with strategic relationships like this with CASE, we believe constitutes the right formula for strong, scalable growth for our platform going forward. Finally, in the second quarter, our Galaxy Interactive Venture Capital team, who manages the Galaxy EOS VC fund within the Asset Management Group, continued to press their advantage in the interactive content space, investing $21.8 million across five new investments and three follow-on investments during the quarter. As you all know, the positive trends in the gaming and interactive space have accelerated at an unprecedented pace, in part as a result of the pandemic's impact on consumer behavior. And so we could not be more excited here at Galaxy about having a top-tier team focused on this correct sector at the right time. Overall, in asset management, we ended the second quarter just above $375 million of AUM. Let me now proceed to Galaxy Digital Investment Banking, which has continued the hard work of establishing itself as the leading strategic advisor, advisory firm in the digital asset and blockchain sector. The team here deserves all the credit available to them. They've worked themselves into the center of many of the most interesting strategic conversations around the space. 
in mining, exchanges, consumer platform offerings, and they've built a strong and growing franchise here within Galaxy that the entire firm can truly be proud of. In 2020 thus far, we've seen continued growth in our mandated backlog of engagements, a growing pipeline of expected future realized fee income, and the team is currently in the execution phase of multiple active M&A and financing mandates. This sustained positive momentum we expect will help Galaxy Digital in transitioning the leadership of our investment banking business in the fourth quarter, as our current head of investment banking, Ian Taylor, will be departing back to Australia then. We wish Ian the best, and we thank him for his significant contributions in establishing this business for Galaxy, particularly in assembling such a highly capable team around him of smart, experienced, and trustworthy professionals who have really become sectoral experts and key relationship builders here for the firm. We're excited to see this team drive our investment banking franchise here at Galaxy into its next phase of success. Finally, in terms of our firm balance sheet and principal investments, our team has continued to selectively pursue compelling strategic opportunities across equity and debt financings. The team invested just over $5.7 million of total new capital in the second quarter into two new and four follow-on investments uh, in the second quarter. With that, I'd now like to turn it back over to Ash, uh, who's going to walk everyone through the specifics of our financial performance in the second quarter. Ash? Thanks, Chris. Um, I will not provide some additional details regarding our financial results for the quarter. Our comprehensive income for the three months ended June 30th total $38.5 million, with the comprehensive income for the six months amounting for to $10.8 million. The current quarterly gain was largely a result of realized gains on digital assets. The second quarter 2020 figure includes $3.3 million of equity-based compensation expense, which is a non-cash charge and has no net effect on equity. This brings our total equity or net book value to $375 million as of June 30th, or $1.82 of net book value per share Canadian, or $1.33 of net book value per share U.S. As of June 30th, the number of compensatory class B units and stock options outstanding was 17.2 million and 22.1 million, respectively. The aggregate compensatory awards have a value of $11.2 million remaining to be amortized over their life. Operating expenses for the three months ended June 30th were $14.8 million, inclusive of equity-based compensation of $3.3 million over the same period. Operating expenses were lower for the three and six months ended June 30th, 2020, as compared to the three and six months ended June 30th, 2019, due primarily to lower equity-based compensation and lower compensation expense in 2020. Regarding our balance sheet, $7.2 million of new and follow-on investments during the second quarter brought the investment balance to $177.8 million. As of June 30th, we held 42 individual investment positions, excluding our cryptocurrency and pre-ICO holdings, with no investment position representing more than 7.8% of our net asset value. We are pleased to report that we had $135.8 million of liquidity as of quarter end. Our liquidity includes our working capital and net digital assets, which is then netted against forward commitments and projected future expenses. Our current liquidity is ample and will allow us to continue to operate the business and take advantage of market opportunities. With that, I'll now turn the call back to the operator so that we can address questions from equity analysts and investors. Operator, any questions from equity analysts? Thank you. Our first question is coming from Deepak Cashel of Steeple GMP. Please go ahead. Oh, hi. Good morning, everyone. I, I've got a bunch of questions, and I, and I kind of hesitate dominating the call, but, but I'll ask a few, and, and if it gets too long, I'll, I'll jump back in the queue. Uh, just on the operating business, um, I'm just trying to get a sense of how you guys performed on your principal book relative to the market. Um, you know, if, if we net a cash deployment, uh, we're seeing a 37% return versus the market up 50. Um, did you guys outperform or did you underperform or were you in line? How do you kind of range yourself? Well, so, listen, I would break it into two halves, right? There's a – if you're thinking about our balance sheet, you could roughly think half of it has been in, in coins, you know, Bitcoin uh, and other coins, and half of it has been in venture investments. Uh, those venture investments aren't – 
aren't nearly as fast to adjust in pricing uh, to the uh, to the moves of, of Bitcoin itself. And so my sense is on the quarter, there were not a whole lot of write-ups in the venture book. Uh, uh, you know, But I think coming down the pipe, a lot of those uh, investments are, are doing much, much better. And you'll see those in next, you know, Q3 and Q4. Uh, and so when I think of it in terms of what beta should we have to the market? How have we done? I think we we probably did very well. You know, we outperformed a little bit of like what it would be if you had just had a had 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 a purely held X amount of Bitcoin and and uh, and I like our book. So it's, it's hard to you know, we don't have a great index. Uh, you know, uh, I think we probably added you know ten million dollars of alpha uh, versus just being long Bitcoin. Uh, and we, you know, in the venture book, we'll see over the next uh, two quarters, but I feel pretty good about it. Yeah, okay. Uh, are there any? Go ahead. Sorry, sorry Deep, Deepak. I'm just going to, I'm just going to back that up with, with emphasizing the, um, in the, in the, in the illi- illiquid, uh, part of our balance sheet, which is, which is significant, um, in terms of our investment portfolio. Like th- th- there is, there is a definitely a lag in terms of, in terms of events and financial reporting in that book and therefore, Future uh, uh, gains or losses versus you know real time market moves in our digital assets and the, and the other thing I'd say is you know I think we, we ended ended the year uh, last year uh, with 106 million dollars of cash um, we still maintain a large cash balance um, uh, we are also pivoting the you know a, a part of our balance sheet uh, we are dedicating towards financing uh, um, uh, companies and other folks in the space in terms of their trading. Right, and so um, so the, the the character of of where our balance sheet is exposed relative to the market um, is is certainly never going to be one to one beta, uh, uh, and is is likely going to be dampened going forward too. Got it. Um, if I think of your, and I'm going to be a hard question to answer. If I think of the venture book or the liquid book as a whole, what would be the vintage of that mark? Would it be a mark at, in the 2017 heydays, or would it be a mark, an average mark during crypto winter? I mean. How, how should I think about the potential for the revaluation of that part of your book and, and you know, versus what we've seen in the public markets or the trading markets on it? Yeah, so I'll let me let, let me I'll try and answer that, and then and I'm going to go over to, to Ash or Mike too to add add color. I mean, I, I think what you're asking is so so we 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 remark uh, all of the investments on a line item basis every quarter um, based on. On new information of portfolio company performance, portfolio company financings, and also market conditions. So, um, so the, the positions in our balance sheet, some some of them do maintain consistent and have not changed. They 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 do they are reevaluated every quarter. So, in general, I would say the 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 vintage of of our balance sheet uh, should closely represent sort of the current times uh, uh, at all times. And now there's some lag. Uh, earlier and later in that, but but in general, it should move with it. So, so I would think about like current market conditions, uh, what they were at the end of June, what they are today. You know, sh- should should ultimately over the medium to long term result in commensurate moves if we're doing our job uh, correctly in value of our illiquid investment portfolio. Deepak, let me take another another crack at that too. So you can. You know, if you take a little time to go through our balance sheet, we break it down into we have a, bu- a bucket of investments in the interactive gaming space, which, you know, those things aren't going to get marked. They're going to they're going to trade more like classic venture investments. They'll get marked up with each ensuing fundraising round, not with a real beta to the market. Um, we have some investments that really have a high correlation to uh, to Bitcoin itself, right? Claims in Claims in Mount Gox's bankruptcy. Uh, some some companies that we invest in that hold a whole lot of Bitcoin themselves, uh, and so there's some where the, there's a pretty direct correlation to the overall market. And then we have a lot of investments in infrastructure, in in custody and security, uh, and those things will do better with a lag. Like the fact that this whole space is energized means if you're a good security company, a good custody company, a good trading company, uh, your business is a heck of a lot better than it was six months ago. Uh, not necessarily doing a financing round to mark yourself up right away. 
you're not necessarily, uh, you know, selling yourself or, uh, or have a real good way of marking it up. And so there's a real definitive lag in, in, in lots of the portfolio. Uh, and so again, I, at the same price, you'd be so much happier to buy it today than you would have three months ago. Uh, and so I, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard, hard way to answer. We're, we're going to try to in the longer and get more specific about bu- bucketing, you know, the, the pieces of our book for, for guys like you so you can have a better way of estimating. Um, but I think you almost have to go through specifically the, and we, we do disclose, I think our top 10, 10 investments. Uh, uh, but it's, it's, it's a mix. It, it's a mix. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we're still going through say, a lot of detail that you guys disclosed. We're still going through it. And we'll probably yeah, I would say Monday, but I would say vintage wise, right? If you, you think what we originally contributed in eighteen were really you know two thousand and seventeen vintage stuff. Uh, the average is probably you know somewhere in eighteen, right? You, you had some investments that were contributed in, uh, in in seventeen, and then we've deployed capital over the last two and a half years at a pretty steady state. Uh, to give you a sense of vintage would be. Great. So, so just to kind of recap, if most of those were in 2018 during crypto winter, then there there seems to be a lot of hidden value in in the venture book on your balance sheet. Is that the conclusion here? I think our venture book is is going to do well. Yes. Okay. okay great. Um, just skipping over to um, asset management. You know, you've seen like other things in the market get some AUM, and and your asset your AUM has kind of been been slow. I know you've got the partnership with Case. So how big of a catalyst can Case be? Um, well, listen, we we what, have what's the pipeline of, of those channel partners, and, and and what's kind of the target it, AUM for the next it, six twelve months? You know, we're gonna we're gonna know a lot more uh, if we may. Listen, we've worked our butts off. We've got great partnerships. Uh, we have we are going after the wealth channel, uh, not the retail channel. Uh, and quite frankly, we'll go after some of the institutions, but they're not coming as fast as what we think the wealth channel will be. And we have set up, we think, the best product with great partnerships. And the, the checkered flag is just falling now. Listen, we've had some inflows, right? We're over $50 million in that fund, but nothing like what we hear or what we expect. And so uh, my expectation, my hope, and my, and my real belief is that come the end of the year, we're going to be gaining assets at an accelerating rate in, in these, uh, with these partnerships. Uh, and, and with these products that we've built. And so, listen, if it's, if it's March of next year and we haven't, we're going to really have to scratch our head and say, what did we do wrong? Uh, but I think we, I don't, I don't think we've done anything wrong. I think, uh, you know, we took a long time to build the right product, getting, getting approved by, uh, Mercer and a, and a green light there is a big, big deal. We're the only fund that's, that's got a, uh, that's got a, um, a, one of the, uh, consultants you know, that, that have rated them. Uh, and that's a big deal for the institutional world and for the wealth world. And so, uh, give us, give us three to six months on that, uh, before you make judgment. And I think you'll uh, be happy. Yeah. Like, okay. Case, I think, case, as you said, case, case on platform, uh, has clients that, uh, that reach a trillion dollars, uh, of, of, of assets under management. The wealth space is, I think, over a $10 trillion market. Um, and we're actively working, working across that entire space. Uh, and like the asset management business, the, the strategy there, uh, which, which we're, we're, this, this is, we, we've invested a lot in this business. Um, uh, this is the year we started turning on marketing. Uh, as I think, you know, you'll see in the FT, we have, we have full spreads talking about Bitcoin and talking about our funds management business. And the, 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 the strategy of the asset management platform is, is, is to build, build the pipes and a, and a, and an institutional quality platform that investors can trust and invest in and then, and then launch product that we think makes sense over the long term that, that are not going to be shots in the, uh, flashes in the pan, uh, that are going to have longevity through markets, through changes in market structure. Um, and so that, that's, those are the products that, that we've launched, um, and, and we think they have long term, long term, uh, uh, um, uh, prospects, uh, which which differs, we think, from our competitors, regardless of of, of current AUMs. Yeah, excellent. No, well, I'm patient, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, I got one more 
question on the operating business and then a couple of big picture questions for Mike. So just on the, on the advisory side, uh, how should we read into to Ian's departure? Um, is this not – this isn't a, another pivot in that business, is it, or – not not at all. We are, we are, we are going to double down on advisory. Uh, listen, it's frustrating. Ian had his own reasons to go back to Australia. Uh, I like him a lot. He did a great job. He was entrepreneurial. He helped establish and build a great team. Uh, it's frustrating, uh, but he's got he's got reasons to go, and I'm I'm you know going to wish him well. Uh, we are we're going to double down on this business. Uh, hopefully, you'll see in the next quarter or two, you know, some great results uh, that we have coming down the pipeline. Uh, but you know, it's a business that we spend a lot of time developing, you know, domain expertise in certain verticals. We've got guys that know more about mining than almost anyone in the space. And so uh, it was always a long lead business of you can't hire a banker and say, he'll go bank something that you know nothing about. But now i got guys that know so much about mining, guys that know a lot about the exchange business. And so as we, as we build that expertise in the verticals and as this overall business heats up, I just think there's lots to do there. And so we're going to be adding bodies uh and, you know, wishing Ian well and, and thanking him for uh, the good start he, he gave us. Got it. Got it. Okay, so, Mike, big picture question. So are we really seeing an institutional wave here in, in this latest rally? Um, what, what specific signs are you seeing? Because I'm seeing just a Robin Hood retail rally in traditional equities. Why is this different? No, you know, listen, we are seeing an institutional wave. It, it, it can't come as fast as everybody wants because when you look at, like, you know, Paul Tudor Jones as an example who, who got into, you know, you've got a – often change your doc, you know, your fund document, you're going to go to your investors, you got to figure out where you're going to custody and who you're going to deal with. You know, so it's not as easy as saying, well, I want to buy gold, let me pick up the phone and call my broker. Uh, we are seeing tons of activity below, below the hood and people buying, right? And so I would tell you almost every macro player either personally has a little desk participating in this uh, and are working – at looking, should I put it in my fund or not? Some have put it in their fund. They just haven't been public about it. Um, and so I think you're going to see hedge funds move into the space. But more importantly, you're going to see, again, the wealth platforms, which are institutional in, in their nature, right? I mean, I've been on calls with heads of wealth wealth management businesses at the major places, at the, at the big bulls back at bank, banks, who are all saying, okay, how do we do this? Um, you saw the OCC. Uh, news that banks can now be custodians. And so when you look down the road, and it doesn't have to be 10 years down the road, three, four years down the road, uh, with stable coins which are on their way and growing fast, with Bitcoin becoming a bigger hedge, with Ethereum's platform growing, with almost every single bank is going to have to participate in this. Uh, when you're big clients, if you're Barclays Bank and you're trading on exchange and your big clients want to trade foreign exchange to a stable coin or want to trade Bitcoin, and you say, no, I can't do it because it's not a great answer. And so, you know, like I, like I said on that my earlier calls, I think we crossed the Rubicon, and now everyone is scrambling to try to be in this business. And so I, I can just tell by the calls I'm on uh, the level of, of portfolio manager who's – engaged in this, who's, who's not asking first-level questions, but asking, you know, third-level questions uh, that we're a lot further along and we're starting to see adoption. Um, listen, we were a 98% retail market. We're not, we're not anymore, but, we're, we're, but we haven't gone to a 50% market. Uh, what's good about the, the institutional hands is they're, they're, they're less leveraged, right? It's hard to get leveraged institutionally in this space at this point. Um, where a lot of retail get leverage out in, on the Asian exchanges. And so in the long run, it will result in less volatility. Uh, you're kind of taking – if you think about Bitcoin, there are only 21 million coins. There will only ever be 21 million coins. And so when when uh, this public company buys $250 million worth and puts them in their treasury, most likely they're not selling those in the next few weeks. Uh, you're just taking supply off the market. And so to me, this is an important – migration of people uh and there's the tailwind that's not going away you know i'd be much more nervous if i thought oh we're going to cure covid and all of a sudden everyone's going to be fiscally conservative but there's not a political map that i can come up with that shows this huge wave of fiscal conservatism coming uh Uh, and so that's it so so i've got one more question and again i thank you for all the airtime i appreciate a lot and and uh, happy to have it. <laughs> um, 
NASDAQ market, we've seen some penny talks, penny stocks get like crypto stocks get quite the bid. Coinbase is talking about listing. Is the window open and, and what's the timing for you guys to look at that market for listing? Listen, we, we are certainly, we always consider all the capital markets options we have. Um, you know, we have a specific issue in we have a big balance sheet. Uh, we need to grow our franchise businesses big enough to, we, you know, to organic growth or acquisition to qualify under the 40 Act to be a U.S. listed company. Uh, I would love to be on the NASDAQ today, only in that there's a lot more liquidity there and there's more excitement there, and I think our stock would trade higher. And so we're commercial people uh, at our core, uh, and, you know, getting there is is, is certainly a, a an agenda item at one point. Um, but we still have a big, you know, we have a big balance sheet, so it's a question of growing the rest of our business so the balance sheet isn't isn't as big as it is relative to uh, – and you know it's interesting. Bitcoin, since it's not a, not a security, doesn't count, and so that that's a big plus. Uh, but it's 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 certainly something on our mind. Okay, well, hopefully um, you can solve the 40 Act issues soon, and and uh, you get a bigger audience out there. But uh, thanks again for taking all my questions. I appreciate the time. Yep. Thank you. Our next question on the line is coming from Mitch Steves of RBC Capital Markets. Yeah, thanks for taking my questions, guys. So I kind of want to start on the investment banking comments you made there, talking about doubling down. Um, so what, what does that kind of look like in your view in six months? What I mean by that is are you looking at basically more uh, crypto mining companies going public? You're talking about special purpose action companies. I think that SPACs are probably the more likely here. That's kind of the message I'm getting. But maybe you can just walk me through what you think that landscape looks like and call it six to 12 months. Sure, sure. And, and and just to clarify the question, do you sort of mean for us or do you mean also like for the market broadly for sort of advisory options? Let's do both. Just yeah, yeah. see if there's a difference. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah, I mean, hopefully they're the same. We're, 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 we want to be pursuing where the where the action is. I, look, I think the I think we th- this year this year started uh, in in earnest what we thought was coming, which was which was consolidation and M and A opportunity. And so um, there there have been a handful of of smaller trades, a couple big trades, um, we're, we're actively working um, mandates um, at, at the moment that that will likely con- conclude this year, um, and so uh, we see the pipeline for that activity continuing and growing, um, and that's just on the back of having a really fragmented landscape, you know, various degrees of success or not so much success. Some companies running out of funding runway, but great teams, great technology. Um, and so uh, you're going to see a con- you, the con- uh, M&A uh, activity from a consolidation standpoint within the industry um, is, is, a, is a trend that is now and, and w- I, we think will be here six months and 12 months from now. Um, uh, you, I, I believe you'll also see external M&A activity or, at the very least, investment um, from non-crypto blockchain companies investing capital and or buying technology um, uh, into the space um, uh, as a way of, of getting involved, um, uh, which I think they're, they're, you know, one example you've seen a bunch of articles out around J.P. Morgan investing in Consensus, one of the one of the largest Ethereum-based uh, developer shops and technology businesses in our space. Um, that's an example of uh, of a part of the market I think you'll see you'll see grow quite substantially six months, 12 months from now. Um, mining side. Uh, really big opportunity in mining. We've 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 said that now uh, for the last couple of months. We we've done the work. We've done the math. The economics are 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 solid and sound. Um, and uh, if you understand Bitcoin and you understand the thesis and you understand how mining economics work, then it looks like attractive return on capital. Um, way better, significantly better than than alternative forms of infrastructure investment. And so, as a piece of a portfolio. We're, we're, we're very focused on the opportunity set for infrastructure funds, for yield-seeking uh, infrastructure investors to look at Bitcoin mining because, uh, because th- the math is there, the capacity is moving towards jurisdictions where investment is a lot easier, like North America and the U.S. in particular. Um, and so, uh, so that, that is a – I think you'll see a lot of project financing – um, I'm not sure if you'll see a lot of public activity, but but you'll definitely see a lot of project-style financing activity um, in Bitcoin mining, we believe. 
Uh, and then you mentioned SPACs. Uh, I, could, I could say for sure we have we have had an inbound, a number of inbound SPAC sponsors, SPAC opportunities, SPAC people, SPACs looking for acquisition targets uh, into our space very recently, um, which is probably no surprise given the amount of capital that's been raised into the SPAC space. Um, and so I, I, you know, whether whether you know. I have a very specific example of, of, of a company we're invested in who, who has been thinking about it, and their perspective has been, you know, first we're going to make a decision about whether we want to be a public company, and then if we want to be a public company, let's make a decision around whether a SPAC gets us there faster, more efficiently, uh, or not. Um, and so, you know, whether that converts into a bunch of, spe- of actual converted SPAC, SPAC uh, acquisitions, maybe, not sure. Okay, helpful. The second one I had is just uh, a little bit changing gears here. It's just you guys' ad- advertising campaign and talking about what the uh, higher institutional demand. So just wondering how you guys measure or or see the value in your own ad campaigns versus just more people being interested in the space by themselves. I'm just curious as what how you guys can bifurcate the uh, the value you're getting there. If there's any interest from that, or if it's really just primarily people coming up to those conclusions by themselves. You know, I think there's a in, – in, certainly in the well space, which what those ads are targeting, right, is there's an education process that us and Case are doing. Uh, we've been doing it for a long time on our own, and now we're doing it jointly with them with that in that space of getting the the wealth managers, you know, the, the registered investment advisors uh, comfortable at how the whole thing works how mining fits into the Bitcoin system, what custody actually means. And so that education piece is, I think, important. Listen, the ad, the ad itself and, and, and marketing is to try to build our brand in that space. So it's easy to get a brand on TV, and we think everyone knows about Galaxy. But our original surveys was we weren't as well-known as we thought. And so we've done a really good job through a small advertising budget, really, between um, online targeted ad you know, uh, marketing and and, and have some of these ads to get the name recognition and the brand recognition way up. And I think that's the first piece of building a a sustainable, big asset management business. And so yeah, kind of back to my first answer, a lot of, in, a lot of infrastructure yeah. invest. Now it's time to start harvesting. Yeah, like sp- specifically, you know, to, to, to one of the parts of your questions, like we're, we, we're, we're, we've done surveys on Galaxy brand awareness. The, 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 numbers, the numbers are we began the year at 2% brand awareness through the RIA channel for Galaxy. And as of, as of the beginning of August, we're, we're at 40% uh, new brand awareness in the RIA channel now after the marketing push this year. So, um, you know, there's, that we're, there's quantitative data uh, that, that drives our decision, uh, that at least has validated the marketing effort thus far. And so from there, once we build brand, you know, our, our thesis in all asset management businesses is build brand first, have good product, AUM follows. Okay, understood. I'm going to shift gears again. So you guys have a lot of crypto assets, whether it's Bitcoin and some other alts that maybe you can't disclose specifically what you own. So I'm curious about how this works in terms of, like, the regulatory framework and legal framework. So as you guys know, there's a very popular way of earning money in crypto, the crypto space now called uh, farming and decentralized uh, finance, right? So if I think about your position now, is there any, um, I guess, any plans? Are you able to participate in that market to help generate uh, additional returns? And then secondly, do you have a view on Coinbase's recent entry to allow customers to uh, put up their crypto as collateral and take out loans? Is that something you guys can participate on? Just wondering how, how it works for you guys and if there's either of those are interesting avenues to you. Sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Chris take you. Listen, we've had a big investment in, in a uh, financing company. I'll let Chris talk about, uh, talk about that space, and then I'll chime in at the end. Yeah, sure. So the you know the 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 we we have we've had a team inside of Galaxy uh, spending a lot of time on on DeFi from a protocol level up um, uh, to use your example the you know, look we we're we we've we've done the work we understand all the uh, all of the projects um, we have them rank ordered as to what we think is interesting and what we think is not um, we we. We, unlike some of some of our non-regulated smaller competitors, do have today um, issues with some DeFi projects. Um, the, re- the reality is, you know, we've done the analysis and 
dealing dealing with a decentralized contract that it is not clear um, at the very least as to whether or not you know you're satisfying proper KYC AML um, uh, uh, procedures um, in not knowing who your potential counterparty could be. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're coming at the space a little differently. Um, we have a handful of initiatives internally where um, we have, uh, we're making investments in technology around implementing into DeFi as opposed to necessarily interacting with the DeFi protocols ourselves. They're still pretty small. Um, the, the, entire, the entire flow in space of DeFi in terms of scalability versus our balance sheet makes it such that to date, you know, I don't think we've missed a whole lot from not – from not participating in, in yield generating stuff in in DeFi, um, and so yeah, look, we're we're, we're close to it. Um, uh, I think for us, in terms of actual participation, is a little bit of wait and see uh, to see how how the regulatory framework evolves, how it scales, and whether it makes sense to us to really be involved directly. Um, you know, turn to the other side, CFI, centralized finance, uh, uh, which. You know, I think Coinbase's launch of, of crypto back loans is a great example of that. Uh, we, you know, we partnered with uh, with Zach uh, Prince and Flory over at BlockFi two years ago uh, when BlockFi created, uh, what, I think, the, the first crypto backed loan. And so we, we've been partnered with them, and originally we're helping them finance all of their crypto backed loans from the very beginning. And so we're definitely big believers of it. Um, we think it's a great product. Uh, uh, I think Coinbase has sort of just come to the party in that regard. So, um, uh, you know, that, that's an activity we've been doing. BlockFi has been in in a big way. There are a couple other players who, who have, who have uh, done that unchained uh, capital, for example. And so uh, that, that, that is all fair game for us. It's all, we think, very interesting. We think, you know, the risk-adjusted yields and returns in those kinds of products are far better than traditional markets because you know there just aren't there isn't a lot of capital chasing it and there's not a lot of people focused on it um, and so that that that's the area, an area where you know we put a lot of time into we put our balance sheet behind um, and we're 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 pretty bullish on. Okay, and then just last one for me. Um, you guys obviously talked about educating people on the space and you mentioned Bitcoin several times in this conversation and maybe only Ethereum once. So I'm just curious, like maybe you could walk me through from a high level how educated the average investor is. I don't expect you to give me ultra amounts of details, but I'm just trying to get an idea of what the range is. I mean, if people still really don't understand what Bitcoin is. I mean, are they educated to the point where they know what DK Snarks is? They know what sharding is? No, what, no. Uh, I, the I different think, types of items are. So I'm just curious where where people are at. I think the the average institutional investor understands Bitcoin as a digital gold and has bought into the, the 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 identity, the social construct that enough people believe Bitcoin is a digital gold, therefore it is a digital gold. And they understand how it's mined and how it's you know, how a Bitcoin ledger works. Uh but I would bet you eighty percent of the institutions of the investors buying Bitcoin don't know what Z Z Snarks are, Z Z Snarks are or or lots of the 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 broader ecosystem and how it works. Now, listen, the, the, the core crypto native community, uh, and a lot of the retail community, believe it or not, that, that has fuel, uh, so much of the, the kind of crypto revolution over the next last four years. They're, they're very educated. Um, and so it's, it's interesting, right? You, you could have a much more sophisticated conversation with smaller scale investors than you would with the big scale investors because those projects are too risky for them or too small in liquidity for them. And so some institutions are also buying Ethereum, you know, and they like the, the they use the silver gold analogy as opposed to, I mean, my, my view of Ethereum is very bullish, but it's very different than, than Bitcoin. It's Ethereum is still in the venture space, um, right? It's a, it's a big, big bet on, on building a, a backbone, uh, uh, you know, a trust level, a trust layer that lots of stuff can get built on, like decentralized finance, like stable coins. And so if Ethereum works, it can be very, very valuable. Uh, the, the, the entire non-Bitcoin part of crypto still is venture. It's still a big sandbox. Um, and, you know, it's, it's proof of concepts. It's things that are starting to work. Um, but it's not ready for 
prime time for the rest of the world, where Bitcoin is a finished product. It's ready for prime time for the rest of the world. And so I think it's a lot easier to have a conversation with a serious wealth manager about putting some of their portfolio in Bitcoin to be a hedge, and they understand that, the hedge versus central banks printing printing nonstop, uh, than it is to get them to try to understand, well, do I need to have a bet on DeFi because it's going to at one point uh, disintermediate JP Morgan and everyone else. Uh, and so I kind of split those into the macro bet and the venture bet. Make sense? Yeah, it does. And just a, a quick follow-up just to, uh, to kind of wrap this up is just out of curiosity, so you said 80% are kind of familiar with Bitcoin. Just to me in my world, uh, once you understand Bitcoin, the next step is understand a basic smart contract. So what percent would you say of your kind of larger cohorts of institutional investors understand what a smart contract is? I think, listen, I think they all understand it. Their, their desire to go down the rabbit hole is probably less. Um, but I think they, yeah. you know, you, and so a lot of that is just like, what, what can I, what can I justify? What can I, what, what feels right for my, for my investors or for, uh, for the bet I'm willing to bake? Again, it's the, if you think of everything other than Bitcoin as a venture bet, it's a very different mindset uh, than who might be buying Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we've seen we, – we've actually seen, you know, tangible examples of, of traditional asset managers who have – who we trade with who have purchased Bitcoin through us who have shifted their – in the last two months shifted their – some of the research efforts on, as you point out, that is the natural place to go onto onto smart contracts and then and, and, and Ethereum specifically. And so it's it's now a, a process of our team spending time walking through all the all the information that we have, our research pieces on Ethereum. That that, that that's the next that's the next focus. That's where where um, that sort of opens up the world, I think, to to everything else next. But the the, the next stop is Ethereum and smart contracts. From a, uh, and, and it seems the obvious asset for them to, to look at for that because of its uh, of its relative size. Okay, thank you for taking all the questions. Thank you. We will now move to online questions. Great, thanks, and thank you, Mitch and Deepak. Um, our first question is: Can you go through the strategy for your trading business, and what are the components of it? Sure, uh, I'll take this one, Mike. If that's okay. Um, yeah, so look, the, the, the strategy for our trading business is is it, it, it's been a long build for us, um, and it will continue to be to, to be a long build and heavy investment for us. The, the the trading business starts with liquidity connectivity and liquidity access, and so we've poured a lot of resources into m ensuring that our platform has access to the deepest pools of liquidity on a global basis, and that we can access them quickly, fast, fa quickly, efficiently, and at low cost, and and with that as a as a foundation, the idea is to is to take that access and turn it around and offer it to uh, other market participants. And so, um, fundamental there: market access uh, and connectivity, and then from there, offering market participants uh, spot trading and execution. And so that that can be either principally with our RTC desk or or um, relatively soon through agency execution. Um, they can interact with the markets, our connectivity via voice and chat, as we've done historically, more recently through our electronic platform, um, where, uh, where traders can access markets um, either via uh, our GUI that we've built or directly via uh, our connectivity via API. Um, and, then, and then in addition to, to from there, from spot uh, um, uh, connectivity, then we we ourselves maintain inventory and have an active um, uh, lending desk, which uh, is meant to provide lending and borrowing for uh, counterparties and allow uh, short sale facilitation and working capital finance for some of the big trading shops. Um, and so our desk offers that. Um, we uh, do do we do bespoke financing and bespoke bespoke leverage, in that we will finance uh, on a secured basis coin. Um, and I think you'll. You'll see us over time uh, productize that into what ultimately becomes everything that what traditional investors think about as margin financing and prime brokerage, um, and uh, and then we've we've made it a, a big push into into providing being a market maker and providing liquidity to the derivatives market, and so whether that's uh, exchange for physical um, <clears throat> from futures into spot, uh, it's the uh, 
Bitcoin and Ethereum options market and um, really uh, pricing and uh, and um, uh, pricing and trading volatility, and then and then wrapping it all together in structured products and solutions for um, for miners and for market participants who want synthetic access uh, uh, to a specific trend or a specific metric without necessarily have wanting to own the physical. And so our structured product uh, lineup is something that we're actively cultivating and, and also going to be offering on platform. And so that, that's the that's the strategy for our trading business. Uh, it, 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 it is it is meant to be a full service. Uh, uh, sell side suite of trading offers uh, to the marketplace, um, and there will be a there will be a very heavy heavy push on the trade financing, uh, uh, margin financing, portfolio based cross margining uh, prime services offering um, uh, for us on a go forward basis to help facilitate market participation. Great, thank you. Um, well, it looks like we've got time for one more question. Um, so our last question will be, the OCC issued a letter allowing banks to offer cryptocurrency custody services. How does this affect your asset management strategy? Yeah, I think, uh, I think that, sure, yeah. I think the, 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 OCC, the OCC announcement uh, makes our business better. Um, it makes our, it, not just our asset management business, it makes our asset management business, our trading business, uh, and our prime, future prime service offering uh, makes that all better, right? We we've said from the beginning we're 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 focused on um, uh, value-added products uh, sitting on top of custody. We, we ourselves we're not going to invest in being a custodian, um, and so having a service provider for us, a custodian, uh, get the custodian role be be pushed into larger. Uh, validated institutions with big balance sheets who are going to give comfort to investors to hold their assets there. All that does is make our business stronger because our business is meant to focus on building products that sit on top of that layer. Um, and so uh, we, 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 welcome, we welcome the banks to, to, to provide, start providing uh, custody solutions. Uh, we, we're in active dialogue with a number of them today as it stands um, for us to be the service provider on top of the custody layer that the OCC has now said um, they're comfortable with banks providing. And so, um, you know, across the board, it makes our business better, I think is the easy answer. Great. Thank you. And I'll, I'll turn it back to Mike for some closing remarks. All right, guys. I hope you uh... – heard our enthusiasm uh, for what we see in our own business and the landscape going forward. Uh, we're looking forward to a, 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 a I hope, very uh, pr productive third, third quarter call in, in the next three months. Uh, we're off to a great start in the quarter and uh, you know, couldn't be more excited about the opportunity set. So thanks for your time and uh, have a great end of summer, <laughs> if you can call COVID summer, summer. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your participation. This concludes today's event. You may disconnect your lines or log off the webcast at this time, and have a wonderful day.